since I came from the Himalayas to America, I met every day many people who say to me, I am a healer, I am a shaman, I am a channel, I am whatever. But it's very difficult to find authenticity in spirituality as we have in a monastic life. And one day in America, I met Christina Hill. She's an authentic channel. She channel Athela. She is very authentic. And it was the reason why I invite Christina Hill to join me on stage at Carnegie Hall a few days ago when I have performed with Myron McKinley from Earth, Wind and Fire. And it was an amazing experience to see Christina on stage, to feel a spiritual authenticity. So I am so glad to direct a documentary that you will see in a few weeks on the app Mind Dive. The title of this documentary is Everyone Can Change. Because before to be at Carnegie Hall, before to become a very well-known, authentic, spiritual, public person, life coach, meditation teacher, singer, dancer, Christina was homeless. She was wrapped, she was abused, she was in many addictions, she was in a terrible situation, but with faith, with an amazing determination, she changed totally her life. And now she performs at Carnegie Hall. What an amazing story. What an amazing teaching, the teaching of the life that we will share together on this documentary with Christina Hill. Good evening, my name is Christina Hill. I'm an international coach and the world-renowned channeler for Othella. Tonight, Carnegie Hall to channel light energy with my friends who are here to provide a burst of light inside New York City. The story of me is something that happened in the past. It's not something that's happening now. That's very important to start this documentary is to realize that I'm not the identity of what happened before. To give people a backdrop of what my life was like before I began to receive light in my life and live from this life. Um, it starts with having everything that I held dear in my life taken away from me. My life before I had a profound spiritual event in 2015 was filled with drug addiction, addictions to multiple different kinds of heavy drugs, basically whatever I could get, and in combination with alcohol. One of my biggest addictions was the inability to stop thinking. And I lived with monsters in my head, demons in my head. And through the addictions, I, I found other addictions outside of the drugs that were also a big high for me. And one of them was prostitution. Uh, making my way um, through life 
and having a quick, a quick fix or a quick way to distract myself from what was going on inside my head. But long before that, I was homeless. And I was in Seattle and I lived in a box. I lived with multiple boxes in different locations. And then I had a shopping cart and I made my way through the city, not knowing what was gonna happen to me. I didn't have any place to go. I didn't have any family that I could lean upon or call upon. Those were the people, the same people that were supposed to take care of me as a child were abusive to me. I grew up in an abusive home. I grew up hiding under the bed and was left in closets. I was left in a shopping mall and had to ask strangers to take me to my mommy and daddy, even though I didn't want to be with mommy and daddy. In my home when I grew up, there was one thing that was for certain, which was pain and love were going to be in the same experience. So I wanted the love, but I knew I had to get punishment in order to get that. Christmas time, for me, it was always a beating before we opened our presents, and I never knew why. I never understood why this was all going on. Even as a small child, five years old, I knew that the people around me were insane. And this insanity was hurt. They were hurt. They were traumatized. They were abused. And so naturally, their way, uh, and they called it correction, was to um, beat me with different objects and, and to create this kind of system where the rewards or the love would come only after pain was experienced. And it didn't mean, um, for them it wasn't personal, it was just the way that uh, their religion prescribed uh, the parenting role. So I grew up in a very fervently religious home and things were, there are things you just don't say. As a child, I was very psychically gifted. I would say an indigo child and I could see things before they would happen. I could see things that other people could not. Everyone has his own way, his words, his concept to describe something that we cannot describe, that we cannot name, because it's beyond any name, any concept. For someone, it's God. For someone else, it's the Buddha, the consciousness. For a scientist, this is the energy. For Christina, this is Angel Atela. We must respect each person because each person has his own way to talk about something that we cannot describe. I heard voices, I heard things. I could see when people were ready to leave their body, in fact, and I tried to help several individuals, several adults, in the moment of their release out of their body. And through experiencing this as a child, of course, I'm curious and I'm a child, I'm gonna say how I feel in these moments. I learned very quickly though that this was something that was considered damning. I was told that my gifts, my dreams, my visions, the things that I was seeing, even the angels, that these things were of the devil and that I was possessed.
as an adopted child and in foster care and feeling this feeling of not belonging, never belonging anywhere to anyone, I believed I was an alien and that my special gifts, whether damnation or not, they, they existed because I had something that was different about me. So as a child, I learned to hide my gifts to protect myself from greater punishments. Though I knew inside of me that something, some light, some love light was pure and that no one could take that from me. I don't know how I, I survived that all those years. One of my siblings molested me for 10 plus years. And I never said anything to anyone. And I, I actually felt sorry for the parents that, that raised me and were, were trying to keep everything under wraps. I felt sorry for him. And by the time I was 18, I just, home was like out there. I didn't have a home. So I needed to go and build myself a home and I did the best that I could. When we're in situations such as abuse like this, we come up with coping strategies, and that is what I did. I landed in um, Mexico for the first time when I was 18. And the first night I was there, the very first night I was there in Mexico City, um, there were people that broke into the home and these men, they were on the roof. I could hear footsteps on the roof. And I woke up to the sound of smashing windows, men on the roof, and a man was holding my, gripping my hair and held a gun to my head. And that was one moment I remember distinctly. Light. I, I felt and saw this light. And I was very peaceful, <laughs> even though I, I, I knew that there was a gun to my head. I was very peaceful. They decided to let us go that night. Um, that, that was a very big event for me. Um, I stayed in Mexico for a few years and had many other traumatic events there. When I landed in Seattle, no home, I started living out of boxes and I found a way to upgrade and to eventually live in my car. And that was around the time that I began using drugs and just combining things, just, just prescription pills. Uh, I had taken many, many pills for all different kinds of mental disorders. And I combined those with street drugs and the alcohol too. So this was all going on and I don't know exactly how I survived all of this at that time except that I knew there was a voice still inside of me, a light inside of me that never went away. It just, it never did.
after many, many years and um, upgrading to my car, I started cleaning homes. I started finding other healthier ways uh, to interact with other human beings and to get out of the situation I was in. And I did find one book. I, I didn't have anything. I didn't have anybody. So I took a library card and I went to the library and I saw a book called The Power of Now. And it just stopped me. And I reached out and I remember my life changed after I read that. And I started becoming aware of my surroundings more, even my own breath. I started to just, just kind of entertain the idea that maybe there's a different way I could live my life. As I began working through house cleaning, I met a lot of wealthy people in Seattle. I was still escorting at the time, I was doing both. And I met a lot of wealthy people that were a lot, a lot more unhealthy than I was. They, they, they were, even though they had it all, I realized that these people, they, they were sick, stressed, and they were just like me, they were just trying to find something to distract themselves so as I was reading continuously this book the power of the now and meditating I stopped little by little I stopped putting so much into my body and I started to feel what it feels like to be it just to be alive it's very simple I decided to get a little bit of, of help and I found that hypnosis and meditation combined was really helpful for me just to settle my mind and I discovered that I could go to the ocean in my mind whenever I wanted to so I started to use that a lot I would see myself at the ocean relaxing doing nothing this is one of the ways, just one of the ways that I stopped using. The 12 step programs never worked for me. I found I was addicted to sex and I, and I went to sex addiction recovery groups and the people that, leaded the, that were leading these groups were trying to, to get to me. <laughs> I went to see therapists that would try to sleep with me, you know. I. It, it became very obvious to me that the only salvation for myself, if I wasn't going to just off and leave the planet, the only salvation for myself would have to come from something beyond all of it. So I said, I'm, I'm going to find out what that is. I'm, I'm committed to finding out what this light that I'm, I feel in me I'm, I'm committed to finding what that is. I feel peace sitting here and I think the rest of you do as well. Peace is possible beyond all the appearances.
It's with a great deal of humility that I'm sitting here. Um, I'm a nobody. Just that through deep suffering, I woke up and then with a library card, I was able to read some books. And I started to pay more attention to the here and now. And like colors and my own breath to become my best friend. I started counting my breath too. And I did that when I was being thrown into the trunk of a car in a foreign country and I saw the trunk being closed down. And I started to count my breath. And even in that moment, I felt peace, just counting my breath. So for me, Michelle and I, we have very different backgrounds. I'm thankful for the suffering. It was my teacher. And I had the very fortunate opportunity of meeting some of the people that gang raped me, and twice, two different occasions. And I felt such deep forgiveness. And how is that possible? When we are very present through our meditations, peace is possible, no matter what. I believe this. I have lived this. It feels as though each of you have also lived this. I am so thankful that you are here to come back to life and be. Through all the drugs and the prostitution and the homelessness and the living in the boxes and the carts and then eventually my car, I learned how to be mindful of my breath and also my feet. Just walking and feeling my footsteps. This was the only way for me to stabilize my mind. And no one taught me this. I just had to figure it out. I had special gifts when I was a child and I could see things that other people could not. And the beatings and the abuse and being molested for many, many years after that. I learned to hide these gifts and I did that very well for a while. This now moment that we're in, all of us together, is the peace. As I understand it, in total humility, this is the only way for liberation. And I desire that for each of you and for each human being. The real deal. <coughs> Thank you for allowing me to be here amongst you. With your permission, I will begin passing an orange to each of you. Hold it in your hand. Be with it. And feel the peace that naturally arises when you're just holding an orange and doing nothing.
can begin to feel this light now. Get past your thoughts and feel, feel this light. Be here right now. You can do it. Since that time, now every day I spend most of my time coaching other people that are also wanting to bring this light into their lives. After I learned that I wasn't the sum total of my thoughts and that there was some presence guiding my life, something beyond my own mind and thinking, other people started to approach me for coaching so that they too could learn this and to, to feel and, and be this. So I now I coach celebrities, I coach people who have everything you could possibly buy, but the one thing that you can't buy is this light. The moment that uh, it's, is deeply honoring for me because I'm introducing and bringing to the stage Michael Beckwith. <laughs> I would like to hear about the art of gratitude and so I would love for you to share that with us. God bless you. Peace and blessings everyone. Look around the room and just see who's with you. Smile at each other. And just get a sense of the joy, the gratitude that's moving through us right now based on what we're seeking to be available for this presence by whatever name we choose to call it, to become conscious of itself as our very life and being. Um, another collaborator we're working with is this incredible coach who has been through homelessness who has lived on the streets, who has experienced severe states of addiction of all forms, drugs, alcohol, prostitution. Um, she has survived, but not only survived, she has become empowered as a human being and liberated from that sufferance. I would like to invite her to stage, Christina Hill. Please come. Thank you, there you are. <laughs> Looking as beautiful Another goddess. Thank you. So, I have one question for you. How is it possible to change, to transform? How is it, how do we get on that journey? Anyone, everyone can change and does change. We do, all the time. It's through this app. If we had that app when I was 
on the street. Oh my goodness. So it's possible to change when we allow ourselves to step into this moment. It's very simple. Michelle and I were in a kayak at one of my retreats where the dolphins are wild and they come to our kayaks. That day they did not. Yes. And something that happened there was we were on the kayak, we were in this chop. And those waves we could see as our thoughts. Yes. And Michelle and I, we were silent in our rowing. And we were looking to the beyond. And he's correct. He said, this is, this is exactly what it means to be, to be. We get beyond our thoughts. We were doing it right now. There's been a lot of sherry, beauty, music, talk. And there is also something to be found in silence. Looking beyond the waves. This, by the way, the dolphins know too. So if we, if we can experience even just looking at a dolphin, it's the transference of that energy that we can feel and it creates change. Anyone can change. I'm here tonight at Carnegie Hall to channel light energy with my friends who are here to provide a burst of light inside New York City. I'm so honored to be here, so grateful to channel light with my friends, Michelle Pascal, a pioneer humanitarian, and I'm so thankful that you are watching this and that you'll join us in our energy explosion of love. Thank you.